Welcome to this presentation of The Bible is the Word of God, presented by the House of Prayer, Bible Evangelism, and Noah's Wonders. Please visit us at our website at noahswonders.weebly.com. The late great Bible teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, among many others, stated that one of the greatest evidences of the truth and authenticity of the Bible as the Word of God is the fulfillment of prophecy, particularly prophecy of the Old Testament. The many human authors of the Bible, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, did not leave us with a record that expects us to believe what has been written blindly, without evidence, and without using proper reasoning. In Isaiah 118, the prophet writes, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. In 1 John 5.13, we are told by the apostle that these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. In 1 Thessalonians 4.13, the Apostle Paul also writes, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, speaking of those that had died in Christ before those that are still alive. The Bible does not expect us to believe what is written therein simply blindly because it's been penned down over the centuries. There are many infallible proofs that demonstrate that indeed this is the authentic Word of God. In my many years of experience working in the construction field, there are many things that we dealt with that were basic common sense. And these basic common sense concepts carry over into virtually every aspect of our everyday lives. One of these areas includes historical research. If we look at a concept and we look at how the elements have been put together from beginning to end, there may be a number of ways in which the elements have been assembled, but only one way makes sense. Let's consider the basic construction of a building. The three main principles, or the three main elements, of putting together any building. We have a foundation, we have the main structure resting on the foundation, and we have the roofing elements which top off the building. Now, we could go through a lot of trouble. We could come upon a building and we could say, I think I know how that building was built. I think somebody erected a very elaborate scaffolding around the building. And from that scaffolding, they hung the roofing elements. That's what they put in first. And after that, they hung the main structure from the roofing elements. And after that, they finally laid in the foundation members underneath, and then they removed the entire scaffolding, and there you have the building. Now, while that's a possibility, that's not really reasonable. And remember what Isaiah said in chapter 1, verse 18. Let us reason. The human authors of the Bible, writing under the inspiration of God the Holy Spirit, did so with the purpose of giving us reasonable explanations of what took place. Having worked in the engineering field for over two decades, I happen to know personally that this is not how we build a building. The way we build a building is as follows. We first excavate the ground and lay the foundation. This shores up the surface to prepare to carry the load for the remainder of the structure that we're going to put on top. We next assemble the main structure. Following that, we finally top it off with the roofing elements. What we're doing is we're allowing gravity, which is a natural existing force, to work with us 
We're not fighting gravity by building some kind of scaffolding first and then going through some kind of elaborate scheme to build this building. Instead, we're letting the conditions that exist work for us by starting from the ground and working upward, doing the thing which makes the most sense. This is the correct way and the way which I'm sure you're already aware that a building is constructed. We use this same principle when we look at how our history is constructed. We use this same principle when we look at how a historical document is constructed to see if the construction matches what the final product presents. And that's how we need to look at any historical document, including the Bible. Now, the same individual who wrote the Gospel according to Luke, that is, the man, Luke, also wrote a second volume after Jesus had resurrected and when the disciples began their ministry during the birth and early growth of the church called the Book of Acts, specifically the Acts of the Apostles. In the very beginning of that book, in fact, in verses 1 through 3, he writes the former treatise, speaking of the gospel that he wrote, The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. And this is one of the things that we're going to test in this message. Are there many infallible proofs that demonstrate that the Bible is the Word of God by having foretold a number of events with such a degree of accuracy that there can be no question that only God could have done this, being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So that's what we're looking for, infallible proofs, things that demonstrate to us that beyond a shadow of any kind of reasonable doubt that the proclamations made, many of which are specific proclamations in the Old Testament, concerning events in the New Testament and concerning events in modern times are so accurate that they could not have simply been guessed at, but that they would have been a matter of true foreknowledge. They must be a matter of true foreknowledge, and that's what we're going to look at. Now, before we continue, there is another video, and that video is called Let's Be Fair. It can be found on the Noah's Wonders website under the Skeptics pull-down menu. And that video contains a segment that totally dispels the arguments that someone could have gone back and rewritten the Old Testament portions of Scripture to make them match events that took place in the New Testament. And it totally dispels the argument that the New Testament could have been rewritten at a later date to make it match up with Old Testament prophecy. So please feel free to watch that video in conjunction with this message to see that the message of the Bible is ironclad when it comes to prophecy, making it indeed the infallible Word of God. Now the first prophecy we're going to examine is the prophecy of the entry of Messiah, that is Christ Jesus, into Jerusalem. And this prophecy is found in Daniel chapter 9 verses 25 and 26. The specific segment of that prophecy that is key is the portion you see here on this slide from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, and that is Hebrew, Mashiach. In the New Testament, the word is Christos, 
which is Greek for Messiah. It's the same word, the prince, and that is the same as Isaiah 9, 6's prince of peace, referring to Jesus, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. Now, you might think to yourself, if you know anything about the Old Testament timeline, that Daniel's time frame was somewhere around the 6th century BC. So you're thinking if Daniel is in that time frame and the order to rebuild Jerusalem as you see here on the slide is in 445 BC and if you add seven weeks and three score and two weeks and three score is 60, so 62 and seven is 69, well, 69 weeks is not even a year and a half. Well, that's a long time before Jesus was born. Uh, you would only be up into about 443 BC, give or take. Well, the reason for that is because when you look into the Old Testament and you look into Hebrew writing, the term weak can have multiple meanings and you have to look into the context. The term week can mean a literal seven-day period. And when you look at the context, if it's referring to a time period, say from a Saturday to the following Friday, that would be a seven-day period. But it can also refer to seven time periods. And it can refer to seven specified or seven unspecified time periods. In this case, it refers to seven years. And we say, well, how do we know that? Well, in the early going, when this prophecy was made, we didn't know that it was seven years. But when the event took place, we can look at the event and we can do the calculation and find out that in fact it was 69 total weeks from the rebuilding of the wall, actually from the order of the rebuilding of the wall by King Artaxerxes to Jesus entering into Jerusalem. And then we have specifically that time period. Now the chart gives us several pieces of information. It gives us under BYRS, that first column there, it gives us Bible years. Bible years are 360 days. That's been translated in the next column to actual days. That's been multiplied out by 360 to give us actual days. And then MC years is modern calendar years, so we can convert that to BC and AD. And then the actual Hebrew year is shown in the second to last column, and the modern calendar date or modern calendar year is shown in the final column so that we can keep track of where we are. Now, from the historical record, we have King Artaxerxes makes this proclamation in the month of Nisan, which is the first month of the Hebrew year. He makes it in the 20th year of his reign. And what's fascinating about this is According to the Encyclopedia Britannica, King Artaxerxes ruled from 465 to 425 BC. And here he's making this proclamation in 445 BC, which falls in the 20th year of his reign. We find that the wall is finished within this time frame. The final stretch of the wall finished in a period of 52 days, although the work on the wall was actually longer than that, we find Jesus entering Jerusalem according to John 12, 1 and 12. We find him entering Jerusalem at this time, and we find Jesus arriving in Jerusalem five days before the Passover. Now, we'll look at that in just a moment. As we mentioned before, King Artaxerxes made the proclamation in the 20th year of his reign in the month Nisan. 
And we're going to see that he actually made this proclamation on the very first day of Nisan. We see from John 12:1 that six days before the Passover, he came to Bethany. And if we go down to John 12, 12 and 13, on the next day, he went to Jerusalem. So it was the next day that he went to Jerusalem. So that's five days before the Passover. Now let's look at all this on a calendar. The first day of Nisan in the year 445 BC, indicated by negative 445 at the bottom right hand corner of the calendar, fell on the 14th of March of that year. Now we know that's the first day because the new moon was on the 13th. And the way the Jewish calendar year, the way the Hebrew calendar year was determined was the first day after the new moon began the first day of the new month. And the month Adar, which was the last month of the Hebrew calendar year, was the previous month, and that month ended with the new moon. As soon as the watchers saw the next sliver of the moon, which would have been on the 14th, they would indicate that as the first day of the new month. So what's incredibly fascinating here is that not only was the proclamation made in the month Nisan, as the Bible records, but it was actually made on the very first day of Nisan. Now moving ahead to the time of Jesus, in the 69th week, 483 years later, we have in the 14th day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. Now what that means is that the evening of the 14th day of the first month is when Passover begins according to Leviticus 23, 5. So that would have to be five days after Jesus entered Jerusalem. Well, we know from John 12, 1 and 12, the verses that we've already looked at, that Jesus did indeed enter five days before the Passover. He entered into Jerusalem. We know that 14 Nisan, the 14th day of Nisan, is the first day of Passover. And Passover begins at sunset on this day. So, and Leviticus 23.5 tells us so. In the year 32 AD, 14 Nisan is actually the 11th of April, making the previous Sunday five days before Passover. We also learn from Matthew 28, 1 and other Gospels that Jesus was resurrected on the first day of the week. And of course, the first day of the week would be the day immediately following the Sabbath day, which would be Sunday, in this case, Sunday, the 13th of April. And that agrees with Jesus coming in on the previous Sunday, the previous first day of the week being crucified that Friday and resurrecting on that Sunday. So since we know for certain that we can nail down the exact day, 1 Nisan 445 BC, that King Artaxerxes made the proclamation to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we add 69 weeks of years, which is 483 Bible years, which multiplies out to 173,880 days, bringing Jesus in to Jerusalem on Sunday, April 6, 32 AD. The margin for error of the scriptures in this instance is zero. The Lord proclaimed not just through one prophet, but actually through four separate sources, through Daniel, through Nehemiah, through the record of John, and through the record of Moses and Leviticus, that this would happen 
or has happened, and there are others that bear record of the same event. These are just the ones we've looked at. This is beyond coincidence. Over a time period of 483 years? And the incredible thing is, within this prophecy of Daniel, there is a 70th week yet to come, in which there will be great tribulation in the world. And Jesus even now continues to call people unto himself, that they might be saved and spared that time of tribulation. You see, the purpose of prophecy in the Bible is not just to show that the writers were charlatans, or that there was trickery, or that there was some kind of magic, or some kind of sorcery. The purpose of prophecy in Scripture is to show that God is God, and that if all of his promises to date have been fulfilled, all of his future promises can also be fulfilled, and in fact will all be fulfilled, including the most precious promise, which is the promise of eternal life. If we look further, we see that in John 19, 14 through 16, the Apostle writes, and it was the preparation of the Passover, that is, the day before the Passover began. Passover would begin that evening. So we are at Friday right now, and about the sixth hour. So we are at about noon. And he said unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified. Crucifixion took place that day, and they took Jesus and led him away. And then in Matthew we see the resurrection, which was the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, that is, Sunday morning came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear ye not, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, Come see the place where the Lord lay, verifying that in fact his resurrection took place on Sunday. Now the second prophecy that we're going to look at is a prophecy regarding an event that took place in modern times. In fact, it's a prophecy that was fulfilled in about the middle of the 20th century. This prophecy is the rebirth of the nation of Israel after not having been a nation for more than two millennia. In Ezekiel chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, we read the Lord giving the prophet the commandment to lie thou also upon thy left side and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it according to the number of the days that thou shalt lie upon it shalt thou bear their iniquity the prophet's action as was often the case will represent the iniquity and therefore the judgment that is to be placed upon the nation of Israel the Lord often illustrated the judgment to come by an action that he would have the prophet carry out. For I have laid upon thee the years of their iniquity according to the number of the days. And this shows us clearly that each one of the days that the Lord mentions is actually going to represent one year of real time. 390 days, so shalt thou bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. And when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah. Forty days I have appointed thee each day for a year. He repeats that a second time. Now by way of explanation, at this time when he gives the prophecy, Israel and Judah are divided. The nation of Israel at this time is divided. There is a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. Israel is the northern kingdom, and Judah is the southern kingdom. So that's why he pronounces judgment upon both of the nations, or both of the kingdoms, because they together are the entire nation of the Hebrews. They're the entire nation of Israel. 
Now looking at our chart, we see that the prophecy given to the prophet Ezekiel was made in 605 BC according to the modern calendar. This prophecy represented 430 years of actual biblical time. That would be 390 days of years, or 390 days, plus 40 days of years, which would be 40 years, with the total being 430 years for the judgment upon the entire kingdom of the Jews. In Bible years, this comes out to 430 years of 360 day years, or approximately 423.8 modern calendar years. Now, in the spring of 536 BC, according to Jeremiah 25, 11, and 12, the nation of Israel as a whole goes into Babylonian captivity. And when they go into Babylonian captivity, they remain there for 70 years. So 70 years of the judgment have been fulfilled in the Babylonian captivity. So there are 360 years of judgment remaining. So there are still 360 years that are going to be exacted. And we think, well, if there are only 360 years left to be remaining, then if they went into captivity for 70 years already, and they only have 360 years left, then somewhere in the 200s BC, give or take, their judgment should be over. However, there is a caveat, there's a warning to this, and this warning is found in Leviticus chapter 26, verses 23 and 24. And this verse reads, And if you will not be reformed by me by these things, but will walk contrary unto me, then will I also walk contrary unto you, and will punish you yet seven times for your sins. So having served already 70 years of their judgment, with 360 years left, if Israel does not return to being obedient to the Lord, their 360 years will be multiplied by seven, according to Leviticus 26, verses 23 and 24, and their 360 years will become 2,520 years. And according to the chart we formerly looked at, that will bring us to the year 1948 and to the month of May. And in fact, the nation of Israel was reborn on May 14th of 1948. So this prophecy was accurate down to the very season, down to the very month of when the event would actually take place. Again, an incredibly small margin for error over a time span that spanned nearly three millennia. Furthermore, you'll notice in Jeremiah chapter 25, verses 11 and 12, that the Lord prophesies through the prophet Jeremiah that the whole land will become a desolation, and it did, and an astonishment, which means everyone will be amazed how this lush and fertile and rich land, which had great cities and great fertile fields, would become a desert. If you look at the area around Jerusalem and Judea today, what was once Judea, it's mainly a desert except for some fertile pockets. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon. They were told specifically that they will serve the king of Babylon. So the prophecy even then was true concerning who they would serve, where their captivity would come from. And it shall come to pass when the 70 years are accomplished that the Lord will punish the king of Babylon and that nation. And of course, Babylon became... Media and Media became Medo-Persia, and Medo-Persia then relented to the Greek Empire, and the Greek Empire relented to the Roman Empire, and now there's no more Roman Empire. The Lord fulfilled His promise, and He says He will punish them for their iniquity, and the land of the Chaldeans, that is the land where the Babylonians lived, and will make it perpetual desolations, and again, 
that region of the Middle East as well. That's the land of Iraq. Again, is a very desolate, barren wasteland today. Now, the final set of prophecies we're going to look at all refer to prophecies from the Old Testament concerning Messiah in the New Testament. Now, this is a very narrow band of prophecies. This band of prophecies is 14 specific Old Testament prophecies concerning Messiah being fulfilled in Jesus. And each one of these is a prophecy that he could not have any control over. He could not have had any kind of control over as a mere man. Things like where he was born, going into and coming back out of Egypt, being born at a time when a heretical king would slaughter children in a town where he was born. All of these different things that took place in and around the nation or nations where he was and, and all of the things that took place in and around his person and all of the things that took place upon his person that he had absolutely no control over. Now, these references come from various places in the Old Testament, but we're only cross-referencing the account that's given from the Gospel according to Matthew. There are many other references of fulfilled prophecy of this type throughout the rest of the four Gospel accounts. And there are many other, a total of as many as 300 prophecies in total that are fulfilled in Christ from the Old Testament. The second item we want to consider, too, is that when I personally ran these calculations, I used the most conservative values possible. Anywhere that an option was simply yes or no, that's the option I took, even though there may have been many other variations. For instance, in the situation of item number three on this first page of the chart here, when there was a slaughter of children as prophesied in Jeremiah 31:15 and fulfilled in Matthew 2, 16 through 18. I didn't consider where there would be a slaughter of children, if the slaughter of children would coincide with a particular time and a particular place, and who it would be under and what the circumstances would be. That would make this number quite large. I just considered if there would be or if there wouldn't be, yes or no, and gave it a probability of two, yes or no. Would he be betrayed, would Jesus be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, as prophesied in Zechariah 11, verses 12 and 13, that we see fulfilled in Matthew 26, 15 and 16? I only considered that to be true or false. I didn't consider any other options, any other circumstances. And the very fascinating thing about that is, that being in the Old Testament, that was in the Old Testament writing, the betrayal took place between Judas Iscariot and the Hebrew leadership of the time who had that Old Testament writing. They knew the prophecy. They were trying to prove that Jesus was not Messiah. They did not want him to be Messiah. He threatened their leadership. All they had to do was offer him another amount. 31 pieces of silver, 29 pieces of silver, 25, 50. But in their pride and arrogance, they had to offer the price of a slave. That's what they had to agree on. They chose it, not Judas. They chose to give him that. I only considered it to be true or false. But there are so many other factors in there, that number could be huge. Those are just some examples. In Matthew chapter 2, the very first one, that he would be born in Bethlehem, I only considered the major cities and towns in Judea. I didn't look at Samaria. I didn't look at any of the surrounding regions, and I only looked at a relatively small geographic area, considering where he might be born and counted the towns in that area. I didn't really expand too large. I mean, that number could be 200 or even larger. It could be a very large number. So those are just some of the examples. Moving to the second slide, if we compile the probabilities from the first seven prophecies on the previous slide, we find that there's a probability of 1 in 15,360, given a very conservative estimate that just those first seven prophecies could have been fulfilled in Jesus. Looking at these last seven prophecies, that he was beaten and humiliated, again, I only looked at two aspects. 
that his back was given to the smiters and that he and that he suffered shame and spitting. I could have considered shame and spitting two separate items. There could have been other factors added into that. I just considered each one of those a yes or no. Now the parts about Jesus' crucifixion are really significant in that at the time that the prophecies were made out of Psalm 22, the prophecies were made through King David. This was over a thousand years before Jesus was crucified. And crucifixion on a T-shaped cross by piercing was not even known at that time. Furthermore, this becomes particularly significant when we consider that the reference in Psalm 22 refers specifically to the piercing of his hands and his feet, which refers to the form of Roman crucifixion at the time that Jesus was crucified, and also the reference in Zechariah, they shall look upon him whom they have pierced, which can refer to both his piercing through his hands and his feet during the crucifixion and the piercing between his ribs, where we read later that the water and the blood came out when they wanted to verify that he was dead before they took him down from the cross, before sunset, as Passover fell. Now the parting of his garments and casting lots for his vesture, that's another item that could have a much larger number to it, because the parting of the garments would be the loose garments, the torn off portions, the portions that are weathered. But the vesture was a single piece garment worn about the chest and the torso. That would be a single piece garment that would not be rent. It would actually be usable, reusable, and of some value. But again, this entire practice was something that didn't exist a thousand years before the crucifixion of Christ. The Roman Empire and their ways didn't even exist at that time. So these numbers could be much larger than the small numbers I've assigned. Now the prophecy listed from Psalm 22 verses 7 through 8 and 11 through 13 where he was reviled and mocked. There are six specific acts that are listed in that prophecy that are specifically named in Matthew chapter 27 verses 39 through 43. So that does give us a 1 in 64 probability. 2 to the 6th is 64, or 2 times 2, 6 times. And again, making his grave with the rich, the prophecy from Isaiah 53 verse 9. I just assigned a probability of either he did or he didn't, yes or no. When we multiply all of these probabilities together, we get a probability of a little over 1 billion. And remember, this is the most conservative that you could possibly consider. You really can't make these numbers any smaller and have any viable kind of calculation. Now the number of one billion doesn't make a whole lot of sense to most of us. We can't fathom what one billion really represents. So I came up with an analogy. Picture a BB, just a tiny little BB. Take one of the BBs and paint it white. The rest of them leave silver or copper color. Take enough BBs to fill an entire football field from goal line to goal line to a depth of two feet. And then, while blindfolded on your very first try, pick out that white BB on the first try, blindfolded. That's the probability of having these prophecies fulfilled in Jesus. These are all prophecies he could not have had any control over. He couldn't have had control over whether he was beaten and humiliated, whether Pontius Pilate was going to order him to be scourged. He couldn't have had any control over whether he was given vinegar and gall to drink, which, by the way, he refused. He couldn't have had any control over whether he was going to be crucified or whether he was going to have his side pierced after he was crucified. He couldn't have had any control over whether his garments were going to be gambled upon while he hung there to die. He couldn't have had any control over when he was going to be crucified and who was going to be there that day. And he couldn't have had any control over who would come to claim his body after he was taken down off of the cross. Nor could he have had any control over the items that we saw on the previous slide. He couldn't have had any control over where he was going to be born, or that he was going to be taken to Egypt and later return, and so forth. 
And again, I call back to the video mentioned at the beginning of this message, Let's Be Fair, which can be found under the skeptics heading of the Noah's Wonders website. This video points out the answers to the arguments that these things could have later been adjusted in the Bible, but in fact they could not have been because there are too many parallel copies in existence, which would have made it virtually impossible to make all of the changes at once. Even at times when a lot of the copies were being made from one place, there were still too many parallel copies in existence. And there are still too many parallel copies being found this very day, not to mention that the Qumran Scrolls, or the Dead Sea Scrolls, as they're better known as, completely destroys any argument of the Old Testament documents being faked. And many of the New Testament documents that are being found, and that have been found over the past several decades, demonstrate that no changes have been made in the New Testament writings, certainly not since the times of the last apostles who did the original writings. Now, as we mentioned at the beginning of this message, the greatest evidence of the authenticity of Scripture is the significant amount of fulfilled prophecy that we find there, both fulfilled prophecy within the Scriptures and fulfilled prophecy that has taken place since the time that the scriptures have been written. With all of this fulfilled scripture having taken place, this gives us further confidence that future scripture will also be fulfilled, and therefore we can trust in the Lord's word to be true for future events. In the last days, the Lord Jesus tells us that we need to take heed that no man deceive us. In Matthew chapter 24, verses 4 through 8, he warns us that many shall come in his name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. David Koresh and the Branch Davidians immediately comes to mind. However, there have been many in recent times, both before and even at this very time, that are claiming to be Christ. You can go on the internet today and find a myriad of people who claim to be either Christ or a direct representative of Christ, but represent things that are completely unscriptural. Jesus also warns us that we shall hear of wars and rumors of war. And at this time, in 2015, we are actually having more wars and battles throughout the entire world than we have ever had in human history at one time. And it's not just one, it's one right on top of the other. But the Lord tells us, See that ye be not troubled, for all of these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. These are all signs. These are all signs of the times, as he calls it elsewhere in the Gospels. These are all things that we look for. These are all the results of our behaviors in rejecting the Lord that bring us to a place where we simply battle one another looking for some kind of truth while rejecting the Lord of glory. I'm reminded of the passage in Revelation where the Apostle John is given a little book to eat, and the book is a book of prophecy, and the book is sweet to the taste but bitter in his belly, and that is the twofold bittersweet nature of prophecy. It's sweet because it's the truth, it's the word of God, but it's bitter because within it, it contains many unsavory truths about difficult things, about difficult times that are yet to come. Jesus further tells us of these natural conditions that in these last days, and we are in these last days, the last days are the time period leading up to the Great Tribulation period during the Age of Grace, the time when all men have the opportunity, all of mankind has the opportunity 
to call upon the Lord to be saved. This is the time that his invitation is open to us for salvation, what we call the age of grace. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there is a difference between the two. Nations are man-made borders. The United States, Israel, Pakistan, Russia, these are all nations. Kingdom against kingdom, these are supernatural borders or supernatural divisions of good and evil. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of this world. That's why Satan is called the prince of the power of the air. At this time, he has a limited reign over the earth, and many people choose to follow him out of ignorance because they simply don't know about Christ. No one has told them about Christ, or they haven't chosen to follow Christ, and so they're blindly following the ways of Satan, which are very subtle and often very pleasing to the person and to the senses. The Lord tells us there shall be famines, there shall be pestilences, and earthquakes in diverse places. Famines, of course, are starvation, and there is a tremendous amount of worldwide starvation today with all of the technology that we have, with all of the foodstuffs that we have available. There is still a tremendous amount of famine taking place in the world, and it's increasing, not just in so-called third world countries, but right here in the United States, in well-developed countries. Pestilences. Pestilences are anything that cause destruction to the human body or to vegetation. And we have an increasing amount of diseases in the way of viruses, in the way of funguses, in the way of blood-borne illnesses, in the way of insect-borne illnesses, in the way of plant damaging and destroying blights, more so than we've ever had before. In the late 20th century, it was felt by many people that we would be able to largely eradicate many of these diseases, many of these illnesses, many of these viruses and funguses, or at least be able to keep them in check with our new knowledge of genetics by the turn of the millennium, by the very early 21st century. But what we're discovering is these things are happening so quickly and mutating so quickly there's no way we can keep up with them. We're discovering more types of viruses and more types of mutations of destructive organisms today than we ever have before, occurring at an alarming rate. And the earthquakes in diverse places, we're hearing about earthquakes in places that we've never heard of before. Sure, we've had a number of earthquakes on the West Coast in the California region, but lately we've had an earthquake off the shore of Oregon. We've had numerous measurable earthquakes on the East Coast of the United States, and we've had earthquakes in various locations under the ocean and in places throughout Asia where there's been no record of them happening before. Jesus says these are all the beginning of sorrows. Again, these are signs of the times, reminding us that if all of this other prophecy has come true already, we can trust the prophecy that's yet to come. And while Jesus warned us of what the state of nature would be in the last days, the Apostle Paul warns us of the coming state of mankind. And we see much of this today. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, which is a passage that I personally reference quite often when people refer to national events or world events today, the apostle writes, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be. And then he lists numerous traits, many of which you and I can identify with on a daily basis some among our own personal acquaintances. Men shall be lovers, and of course this means mankind, the Greek word 
is anthropos, from which we get anthropology. It simply means mankind, lovers of their own selves, people being more interested in their own personal interests than anything else, covetousness. I've often thought about writing a short thesis or an article on the two most destructive words in history, and those words are, I want. Because when an individual's personal interest is in nothing more than what I want, then their field of vision, their sphere of influence, extends about three feet from their body. And they have no true concern over what happens anywhere else. And worse, they're not willing to do anything to make any changes in the world about them. Oh, they like to complain about what goes on. That's another element that comes up later in this list, but they do nothing about it. Other traits, boasters, proud, blasphemers, in any way possible denying the Lord God, disobedient to parents. Of course, if the parents are denying God and disobeying God and rejecting God and slandering God and blaspheming God, in other words, the parents have no authority, why should the children feel that their parents are an authority to be followed either? Unthankful. Unthankfulness is rampant today, unholy, without natural affection. In our time, within the past 70, 80 years, the true meaning of love has been utterly replaced with lust and desire. Everywhere you look now, people refer to sensual attraction and sensual desire as love. Truce breakers, people who are totally dishonest, their word is not their creed anymore. Their word means nothing. There was a time even in my lifetime where a handshake meant a hundred times more than a signed contract. Not anymore. False accusers. This is the complainers. This is why the talk show era that began back in the 80s has become so prevalent. People love to complain about things. They love to accuse somebody. They love to blame everyone and everything else in the world for their problems. But they won't do anything about fixing their own problems, and they won't do anything to make the situation better. They'll just count themselves as victims and complain their way through lives. I've noticed a lot of non-Christians do that, and they complain to Christians, or they complain about Christians. And my answer is, well, look at the average Christian's station in life. And I realize certain people have difficulty with finances, or with things that are beyond their control, but the Lord helps them through those things, and their attitude is entirely different. But they're not running around being miserable all the time. What is my station in life? What is my attitude towards life? And what is your attitude towards life? And what is your station in life as a non-believer, as someone who rejects Christ? In fact, as someone who ridicules Christ, Trusting the Lord Jesus Christ is the best thing I've ever done because he turned my life around. And now in the most dire of situations, I find not always happiness, not always happiness, but joy because I have peace in who I am and above all, where I'm going. Some of these other ones, incontinent, just not able to control yourself, your attitude, your anger, your desire, anything, not able to control yourself fierce, despisers of those that are good, not just simply rejecting those individuals, but utterly despising them, hating them, and having to viciously attack them. We see a lot of that today. It's not someone just simply living the way they want to live and leaving a believer in Christ alone, but viciously attacking a believer in Christ, or for that matter, viciously attacking someone who just wants to live a good moral life. Traitors, again, someone who can't be trusted, heady, full of themselves, high-minded, thinking they're better than everyone else, and lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. The Apostle Paul tells us of these people, they have a form of godliness, but they deny his power, and he says to the believer, from such turn away. And he makes a comparison. He said, these are the same sort of people which creep into houses, sneak into a house in the middle of the night, and they lead captive silly women laden with sins. It almost reminds me of what I hear about these fraternity and sorority parties on college campuses, and I won't go into any 
great detail on these things. Led away with diverse lusts. Just doing all sorts of things that are filled with degradation and debauchery of the human body and the human mind. He says of these people, and remember the Apostle Paul had the equivalent of at least two doctorates, one in theology and one in law. He said, these are ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And we see this today. We see all of this today and we see it more and more. One of the comments that I make is that people hide their doubts and their fears behind a facade of intellect. They know there's a God. They know that they're accountable for what they do. The problem is they don't want to be accountable to him. They want to do what they want to do when they want to do it. And because most of the world is doing things that way, they say, well, it's okay. Everybody's doing it, so I'm going to do it too. By the way, that was a saying from the 70s. Everybody's doing it. And so it's majority rule and not what's right rules. But no matter how smart we get, we'll never be smarter than the one who created everything, including the minds that we use to try to reason God away. Finally, in the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ, the Apostle John gives us the state of the church in these last days. In Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 17, the Lord reveals through his apostle as he speaks to the last church, the Laodicean church, which is not only the final church of the seven churches he addresses in Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey, but also it's chronologically the seventh church age that is referred to. The church since the time of Christ has gone through six phases or ages. Each one is represented by a church mentioned in Revelation chapters 2 and 3. And we are now in the seventh age, the Laodicean age. And the Lord Jesus Christ says to the Apostle John to tell the Laodicean church, and by proxy, to tell the church in general. And this doesn't mean each individual church, but the church in general. Because thou art lukewarm, I will spew, which literally means to vomit with force. I will spew thee out of my mouth. You see, the problem is, generally today, the church that calls itself the followers of Jesus Christ is living in pride and says, I am rich, I am physically rich, I am monetarily rich, I am materially rich, I am increased with goods, I have all that I need and more, and I have need of nothing. I have need of nothing, forgetting that we all need Christ, first of all, for our very existence, and most importantly, or as importantly, for our rebirth. But the state of the church will actually be wretched and miserable and poor, because we are poor in spirit, so poorly following Christ, so poorly executing his commandment to love one another, to serve one another, to share the gospel with the lost. We say we love one another. We say we save the lost. We say we don't want to see anybody suffer the torments of eternal punishment. And yet we're so reserved about telling the world about Christ and his free gift of salvation and the simplicity of inviting Christ into your heart. The church is blind, not realizing, having left their first love, that the church is stumbling about without a light, without a direction, following all of these worldly ideas and neglecting the Word of God, which he left to be our guide, along with the Holy Spirit who indwells us. And we are naked before God. He sees all. And so many of the church have strayed that many in the church have become a laughing stock of the world. It's very embarrassing for the church to be called out by the world for being wrong in the eyes of God. But even to these, the Lord provides his blessed hope. As he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. 
be zealous, therefore, and repent. For those that are saved, that are in Christ, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. For those that are lost, call upon Christ. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. All of this brings us to the point where we know that we can trust the promises of Christ Jesus concerning eternal life. He says in Matthew 11:28, Come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He further says, My yoke is easy and my burden is light. You don't have to work to come into heaven. You don't have to beat yourself to death to make it into heaven. Come receive me. Walk with me. I'll give you the work to do, but your salvation, your journey into eternal life is already assured the moment you receive me and begin to walk with me. All that the Father giveth to me, he says in John 6, 37, shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Jesus is not a partial giver of salvation. This is a promise. We see all of these prophecies fulfilled so that we know that when Jesus gives a promise, it's true. When you come to Jesus, when we come to Jesus, we are His forever. He will never cast us out. In Revelation 3.20, after having addressed all seven of the churches, He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. That is precious, blessed communion. Not a ritualistic communion, but a personal communion. Not religion, but a relationship with Christ Jesus. One that I walk in with him every day. One that every believer walks in with him every day. That's where our joy comes from. That's why we have peace in the greatest times of trial. And the two greatest promises... The invitations to the lost. In Revelation 22:17, he says, And let him that is a thirst come. He that thirsts for eternal life. He that knows that one day this mortal flesh will dry up and has no idea what's beyond. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. Because the water of life, as he promised to the woman at the well, in the Gospel according to John, is a living water that will spring up in you eternally forever. And in Romans 10, 12 and 13, he says, For the same Lord, this is the Apostle Paul saying, For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. There's no difference. Whoever calls upon him gets exactly the same treatment and receives the same gift born of the same promise. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved.